moving ahead with those with those components when we are talk when we refer to the complements of a verb that is object of a verb that is called an argument so i i, I just wanted to introduce this term to you uh, argument refers to the complement of a verb and when we look at the distribution intransitive verbs verbs do not have any argument transitive verbs have one and and ditransitive verbs have two arguments which means intransitive verbs will have no noun phrase in the in the predicate no np in the vp inside the vp transitive verbs will have one np inside the vp ditransitive verbs will have two nps inside vp that is what is the meaning of uh, verb that is what the meaning of verb and its arguments arguments of a verb can only be an np or an ip and sometimes a pp is this is this making sense when we say argument of a verb can be an np that that should be pretty simple that is i john likes pizza the np pizza is an argument of the verb uh, which is uh, like uh, which, which is like how an entire sentence can be an argument of a uh, argument of a verb or a post positional phrase can be an argument of a verb is what i which is i'll is something that i'll uh, work with you if we have a sentence uh, john met with his doctor what's the what's the element that is an argument of the verb uh, what's the what's the element that is an argument of the verb meet what's the phrase that is the argument of the verb meet john met with his doctor doctor with his doctor is the entire phrase which happens to be the argument of the verb meet therefore in that case the argument of the verb is the entire pp that is prepositional phrase how the whole sentence works as an argument is something that i'll show you the the relationship again the relationship between arguments and their uh, verbs and their arguments is called categorical selection verbs select a particular category of elements for its argument this is called categorical uh, selection rules uh, and this is also called a lot of times subcategorization for example uh, the verb meet subcategorizes for a pp if if i if i say this sentence a verb like meet subcategorizes for a pp it simply means that any time we say we use the verb meet in a sentence we are going to have to use a pp as its complement a pp as its argument some verbs select for an np and some and and other times a verb selects for more than an np i i want to demonstrate that to you in a moment let let's look at this example of the verb no it takes an np as its argument uh, what's the first sentence here can somebody read the first sentence for me please John knows the time. Is it visible? Clear? John knows the time. What's the what's the argument of this verb? No. The time. The time as an NP. Okay. Same verb can also take the full sentence as its complement, as its argument. When we say John knows that the world is full of noises. the world is full that the world is full of noise is a complete sentence 
in fact it is more than a sentence which becomes the, uh, the complement of the verb no. Is this a good sentence? So, in this case the verb no can also take an entire sentence as its complement. Okay? which means we can say a verb like no subcategorizes for uh, an NP or for an uh, for a complete sentence. Sometimes the same verb can also have an interrogative sentence as its complement. I, and I have not talked to you about the difference between a declarative sentence and interrogative sentence in terms of their x bar and their uh, structural representation. Hopefully, I will get this time to do that today. If you look at another verb like ask, we see ask just like the verb no takes as an NP as its complement, it can also take, but, but it does not take the whole sentence as its complement. In, in number 2, to be if you see a sentence like John asked me that the world was full of noises, this is not a grammatical sentence in English. John asked me that the world was full of noises is not a grammatical sentence of English, which simply means that a verb like ask does not subcategorize for a full sentence. However, John asked me what the time was is a good sentence. That, that, that refers to a categorical selection rule in the sense that a verb like ask can take as an interrogative sentence as, a, as its complement, but not as the declarative sentence as a complement. So, a verb like ask can take an NP as its complement, an interrogative sentence as its complement, but not a declarative. I, I have just one more example of a verb wonder. This sentence does not take NP as its complement, such as a sentence like Paul wonders the time is not a good sentence. Therefore, we can say it does not subcategorize for an NP. It does not subcategorize for a full sentence either in the sense that we cannot say Paul wonders that the world is full of noises. That is also an ungrammatical sentence. So, it, the, a, a verb like wonder does not allow us to have a full sentence as its, as its complement. However, a verb like wonder allows for an interrogative sentence as its complement and we can say Paul wonders what the time is. Now, look at these three verbs know, ask and wonder and then we see according to the categorical selection rules, this verb, these three verbs have different different elements as their uh, complements, as their arguments. Are you with me? Likewise, every verb will have to select one or the other categories as its complement. The underlying assumptions of the things that we are discussing right now is Arguments, when we talk about the arguments of the verb, we are still talking about things within predicate. Subject as a noun or a noun phrase is not part of the argument of the argument of the verb. Therefore, we are not talking about how subjects work. Subjects is outside the predicate, and with that, the assumption is a subject is a required element in all the sentences of all the languages of the world. We, they are, we cannot have a sentence without a subject. Uh, therefore, subject is not part of the argument structure of a verb. The verbs have freedom to select its argument depending upon its nature in the following way that you have seen, but they do not have liberty to select their subjects. These are the underlying assumptions of what we are discussing. A little bit more on categorical selection rules. If we are talking about an adjective, 
then adjectives will take a prepositional phrase in a language like English as its complement. Adjectives will not take n p as its complement or adjectives cannot take another adjective as its complement. If you look at the examples that you see on the screen, we can say found of fond of the fond of the tall student. This is a good 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 phrase, fond of the tall student, but we cannot say fond the tall student. What is the difference between these two phrases? Fond of the tall student and fond the tall student? Of the tall student is a P. The tall student is a tall student, the tall student is a noun that is an N p and of the tall student is a P p. According to categorial selection rule imposed or the categorial selection rule that restricts N, uh, that restricts adjectives, the rule says you can only take P p's as, as your complement. Therefore, if it selects found of the tall student of the tall student that is a good sequence, just the tall student is not a good sequence. That is why it crashes and results into ungrammaticality. It cannot take that is an adjective cannot take an intermediate category as its complement either. That is we cannot say fond tall student and it cannot an adjective cannot take itself as its complement that is we cannot say font tall. Therefore, these sequences are not uh, warranted and the only sequence that is warranted in these cases is when an adjective takes a complement takes another takes a p p as its complement get it. Talking about nouns what do you see? about now what are the restrictions on nouns uh, when we see queen of the blue isle is a good sequence but queen the blue isle is not a good sequence what does this tell us Come on, loudly, please. You can only use a proposition. Nouns require P P complement. Doesn't sound very, very encouraging. I think I, I I think this is visible, quite clearly visible. Yes, no. Nouns require preposition P complement. Preposition phrase as a as a complement of the of a noun is good, but noun phrase as a complement of noun does not seem to be good. Is this is this not is this not visible? I, I think that is all you have to say. Uh, similarly, an adjective does not a noun does not take an adjective as its complement we cannot say queen blue okay all right prepositions typically typically require np complements where we can say on the brown table we cannot say on brown table in english uh, therefore on brown table is ruled out whereas on the brown table is a grammatical sequence. It does not prepositions do not take even bare nouns as its complement we cannot say on brown. Prepositions do not take another prepositions another prepositional phrase as its complement in the sense that we cannot say things like on below the brown table. So, if, if, you are, if you are given an assignment like some of these ungr ungrammatical uh, sequences and asked to explain, it's, it, these are not uh, big 
complicated problems. On the on below the brown table is not a good sequence because a preposition does not take a prepositional phrase as its complement. There is something called semantic selection. If we were to talk about the same verb no in terms of its semantics, the same restriction will be described in different terms such as we can say a verb like no, for a verb like no, a complement must be a question or a proposition or for a verb like ask and wonder, a complement must be a question only. This making sense? What is the, then, then what is the difference between categorial selection rule and a, sele and a semantic selection? If this is making sense, then please tell me the difference between categorial selection and semantic selection. I, I let you think about this for a moment. I think it is it's, it's pretty simple to deduct and uh, I have no doubt about your capability to do that. You can see this. There is another aspect of uh, uh, elements in a sentence which is called lexical selection. Some of the, some of the elements, terminal elements like a verb or a noun will always select a particular type of, type of other element such as when we look at the verbs like depend or rely, the only preposition that these two words will take is on. We can only say depend on or rely on, these two verbs do not take any other preposition. Such type of restriction is called lexical selection restriction on the element. You can look at the list, a verb like hope will only select for for and a verb like toy will, toy when it is used as a verb, it can only select a preposition with. Uh, by the way, let us go back, go back to the sentence, uh, sorry, let us go back to the last slide. Can you, can you give me a sentence with toy? She toyed with my emotions. Yeah. Don't toy with me. She toyed with my emotions. Okay. Semantically correct. No, 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 it is perfectly fine. Uh, it, it, yeah, you are right, it may have sem uh, semantic restrictions on this, but we cannot say, you okay, have to no. say do not toy with me. You cannot say do not toy on me, do not toy for me do not toy at me, other, other prepositions are not allowed. Can I get a verb sentence with hope? Hoping for good. We hear this sentence all the time, hope for the best. For a free class. Do we? We cannot say, we cannot use any other preposition with this verb hope. Uh, Let us look at some, of, some, some examples of nouns and adjectives. Uh, a noun like desire can only take for, it will never take off or any other uh, preposition. At the same time, a noun like love can take prepositions for and off. Uh, I, I assume that you can use these things in sentences and see these restrictions for yourself. I am moving ahead with the other things that I have to do. Uh, similarly, some adjectives and, and I am only giving you examples of some of these uh, categories. M there, there is a huge bunch of nouns, verbs, adjectives with these kinds of selectional restrictions on them. You can see uh, an adjective like proud or ashamed can only take no, a preposition of, none, nothing other than that. Uh, an adjective like similar takes the preposition to and you can go to the list and see that. I was, I was talking to you about selectional restrictions on verbs, on, on different elements of sentences so far. Sometimes lexical items like words have their own selectional restrictions as well. Sometimes whole category 
have their selectional restrictions like verbs can only take certain types of complements. And some of the some of such restrictions can be explained in semantic terms as well, which are referred to as selects as semantic selections. Uh, so, now I combine couple of things that we have discussed earlier with uh, current discussions. We have talked we, we have talked about lexical categories, which means words, and I'm not sure if I have mentioned this before, but we have. Uh, we, we, if we, if I haven't, then we are going to talk. Be to, we are going to be talking about functional categories, which are invisible elements in sentences, such as tense, aspects, case, number, and gender. We, we, when I say we will be talking about case, number, gender, we are not going to be talking about singular and plural, or uh, or uh, uh, present, past, and future. We are we are going to be talking about their representation in generative mechanism of sentences. How does a sentence, how do we grow a sentence, how does it work and how are different aspect, different uh, elements of a sentence projected in X bar theory is what we are going to look at. A sentence, uh, I, I felt like spending little bit time on this thing, but the structure did not allow for that. So, I can just go ahead and tell you that a sentence is called in X bar theory an inflectional, inflectional phrase, which, uh, which inflection refers to these invisible categories like tense, aspect, tense and aspect in particular. So, when you draw a structure of a sentence, you are going to see, uh, I am going to use the whole board today. So, you are going to see here the X p is equivalent to an I p and then we have following the same uh, same restrictions on x bar we are going to have this following endocentricity the head of an ip is going to be an i and the head of a com and the complement of this i is going to be a vp is this may is this making sense so far now what it what it means very sim in simple terms is this is this is an ideal structure of a sentence where the specifier of a sentence which is usually an np and could be more than that is the subject this is where the subject occurs and the rest of the sentence which is part of the predicate occurs here. So, uh, complement, so the, the, the entire predicate is going to be the complement of the, the head of the sentence which is an I. Now, what is this I is a little bit uh, complex in the sense that it has several elements in it. Let me, let me show you the use of these things in a couple of sentences. Uh, some of the, some of very simple sentences like these, uh, I like pizza or Raju likes pizza. How do you, how do you think these categories will project themselves on this structure? The subject of this sentence will come here, and when we when we draw an actual tree, we don't we don't write all of these things. I'm doing it just for you to see that a subject is an NP, which is also known as the specifier of the whole sentence, and in this case is in one of these examples, it's Raju. When we look at the Word phrase, we see the structure developing like this. Now, there is nothing, uh, no specifier available here for this verb, but what is the verb in this sentence? This, this second one? We have the verb like and then 
complement as a as a complement of this verb we have an np i am just going to i am just not going to uh, uh, expand that so the verb is like now what comes here as an i is tense and what is the tense of this sentence? Present. Present. So, this is where the tense is going to show up and then we get I like pizza. Now, so let me give you, let me give you 30 seconds and one more sentence uh, before I come and talk about these things. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, is this, are these things clear now that a sentence is a combination of a subject and a predicate and because pre subject is outside the verbal structure of the sentence, so there must be a subject otherwise the sentence is not complete in all the languages of the world, which also means a sentence must have a predicate because without the two comes two coming together, we do not have a sentence and verbs may or verb may have its complement that is sometimes some verbs may not have their complements. Uh, before I come to these sentences, I want to give you a sentence, I am eating a pizza. Can you write this sentence in your notebook? I am eating a pizza. I am eating a pizza. Can you very quickly draw this thing in your notebook before I do it on the board? should not take more than 30 seconds. Done. What I am interested in finding out is as far as the VP of that sentence is concerned, we still have eat and pizza, right. As far as the subject of that sentence is concerned, that is a still, that is I. So, which goes, which, which is in a specifier of the sentence and we have a VP. We are interested in this domain of I and uh, what is the tense of that sentence? Continuous. Present. present continuous. Is there something called present continuous as tense or how many tenses have you heard about? Present. How many tenses have you heard about? If we talk about tense, Three. how many of them? Three. 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 Which are they? Present, past and future. Now, I, 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 like I said, I keep admiring this all the time. You guys are very bright. So, what is continuous in that? Continuous is an aspect. aspect, which makes us, and and these are very elementary, very simple things. It just requires our attention, not really, uh, a great, not really a matter of great discovery. When we say aspect, we simply mean the tense is something which is different from aspects. And if that is so, then we need to know two things about them, about that particular thing. First, what does it do in a sentence? And second, how, where does it get represented? These are the only two questions that we need to answer. 
So, can you tell me about the first thing? First, first question should be simple. What does it do in a sentence? What does an aspect do in a sentence? So, for example, in this sentence, I am eating a pizza. What, what refers to this aspect is eating, and not the whole part of eating. The, the inflection on the verb eat, which is an ing, it refers to something, which is, what you said is uh, continuous. continuous. So that continuous aspect tells us that this whole uh, process of process of eating is still in progress, is still continuing. This is why we call it a continuous aspect. So, when it comes to representation of these aspects, where do we represent that aspect in this structure? If we are happy with this structure that you see on the board right now, then we know that we have no place for the representation of aspects in this structure. Is this true? Do you see any place where we can represent it, uh, where, where aspect can be represented in this structure? There is no place for that. As far as this much was in practice, this structure was in practice, what was assumed is tense and aspects both are going to be here. Now, one, one projection that is I cannot take both of them or we can say they are the same thing. If we say that only I is going, only the, the projection I is going to contain both tense and aspect then we are making a wrong prediction through this structure that there is no difference between tense and aspect. However, they happen to be two different things. Now, the only reason why I am mentioning this to you is because this I p, this head I, this is one example of inflection in a sentence. This is why the whole thing is called inflectional phrase, number one. Number two, when people worked on these things further, they came up with this idea that no, this I p has two things in it, at least tense and aspect. So, this must be divided into a tense phrase and an aspect phrase. That was another, another development. A consequence of that development was which one projects the sentence, that is which one is more important in a sentence, tense or aspect. That is, do we call an I p? T p or something else. Are you with me? I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's, it's not really very significant for us to go into each one of these details, but I want you to know and be familiar with these complications in, in going further and complications in retaining the simplicity of I p both. That is the, that's the point that I want you to understand. Making sense? Okay. So, I, when we say inflection or I, it, it simply means a bundle of features which could contain tense, aspect and few more. At one point, uh, I p was divided into two tense phrase and uh, aspect phrase and then when the sequencing, people worked on the sequencing of both they started calling the whole thing as agreement phrase. And these, these, are, these are not important things for us to, to, to discuss at this elementary level, but I just wanted you to know why this, why this kind of, uh, why these things came into existence, why these things were discussed at all in the whole uh, uh, debate of uh, projection and phrase structure rules. I want you to take a note of two, three sentences from here. Uh, sentences like uh, the first one, John loves Mary is a simple sentence that you have seen, the structure is in front of you. We have talked about verbs like no and then we know that sometimes such a verb may have the entire sentence as its, compli as its complement. So, when we have a sentence like I, John knows that Bill loves Mary, how do we project these sentences in X bar? That is number one and number two, we have sometimes interrogative sentences like who likes Mary. Where does this, where do these elements like who 
and what go in the phrase structure. If you can help me finding that book, looking at the phrase structure and not me going through each one of these sentences one by one on the board, probably we can move little, little faster. Okay? So, please look at this uh, book, please get me these, uh, the structure of these things and uh, would not be a matter of surprise, maybe I will ask some of you to draw these things on the, on the board. All right? Thank you.